You're watching We Heart Therapy, the special series EFT Talk. I'm your host, Annabelle Bugatti, licensed marriage and family therapist and certified EFT therapist here in fabulous Las Vegas, Nevada. We have a really exciting guest today. We have Lori Brubaker. She is the director and an EFT trainer of the North Carolina Center for EFT in North Carolina. She's an LMFT and a registered MFT in Canada. She's also an adjunct professor at the North Carolina State University in Greensboro. UNC, Greensboro. University of North Carolina in Greensboro. And she's going to talk to us today about our topic. So we're going to talk about rebuilding trust using EFT. So oftentimes, guys, you'll have clients who come into your office and they'll say, you know, we, we need to rebuild trust. I don't trust my partner. Maybe they lied to me or there's an affair, something, something that happened that's injured the trust. And they're coming in and saying, we need to rebuild trust. And you're thinking, okay, how am I going to use EFT to help rebuild trust? And Lori is going to help us with that. Thank you so much, Lori, for being with us today. It's nice to be here, Annabelle. Thank you. And it was interesting when you suggested the topic of um, building trust. Um, actually, I didn't hear the rebuilding when you first suggested it. But it occurs to me that whether our clients have come in complaining of a betrayal, like he lied to me or she cheated on me, whether or not they've defined something like that, basically when a relationship is in distress, there's a lack of trust. Mm -hmm. right? Basically, we're working with um, issues of trust in, our whole, in the whole process. And I, I looked at my book when you told me I did a search through the book, the PDF of my book, and I see trust comes up throughout the entire model. The word is used so much. So, um, um, yeah, you're absolutely right. Because sometimes we see clients who say, well, I just can't trust this. I just can't believe it. Even though there might not have been a major betrayal or, you know, an affair or something, trust still comes off in a smattering of ways with our clients. And so being prepared as to how to address that will be really helpful for the therapist. So help us understand a little bit more, you know, so the clients come in, let's say that maybe they have had some kind of overt betrayal to uh, the trust in the relationship. So in stage one, are we going to put that into the cycle? We're going to put maybe the lies that one partner might have told. Will we put that into the cycle? How will we begin to work with that through the EFT frame? And is there a conceptualization of maybe telling lies through an attachment lens? Well, first, I think it's important to know that we have a very reliable model to work with. So the content or even the difference between a slow erosion of trust from a repetitive negative cycle or from a particular event, um, when one partner was in need, reached to the other and they let them down, which we call an attachment injury, whether it's from that pivotal moment or from the erosion of the cycle, trust is an issue. And we are going to be going through the steps of the model regardless, right? So our first step, step one, is building the alliance. And we know that regardless of what the content that they're giving us, even if they're just like, well, I don't know, our relationship's kind of dead. Regardless of the content, the first thing is we need to work on establishing a trusting relationship with each partner, mm -hmm. right? And so we're doing that in step one and throughout the model. And so cut into that because that's really important what you said about building an alliance with each partner. And I know that you know, EFT, we teach relentless empathy, which is critical in that moment of alliance building because oftentimes, you know, as you said, whether it's been a slow erosion or a particular attachment injury, some therapists, particularly in other models, may have a hard time being empathic with the partner who has possibly committed the betrayal or maybe told a lie or stepped out of the marriage. It can be difficult to be more empathic and EFT does a beautiful job of helping us come alongside both partners to be empathic. And, and I think, you know, and tell me if I'm getting this right, you know, part of the EFT model is, you know, these things are there for a reason. These clients have an attachment motivation that these things are happening. And through the outlining of the cycle, we're going to find that out. So that can help us gain more empathy towards each partner. It's, it's probably easier to 
be compassionate towards a person that's been injured, but the person who did the injuring, sometimes it's hard, right? And EFT does a beautiful job of teaching us how to find empathy for both partners as part of that alliance building two people in the room. Right, and we're stuck. You know, we can't move past step one. If we find ourselves, I mean, we're stuck until we notice it, and then we can do something about it. But if we find ourselves kind of taking sides with one partner, we're in big trouble. Uh, we'll, we'll feel our own physiological arousal. We'll feel ourselves getting triggered with the partner that we're kind of uh, putting in the doghouse. And so, of course, we cannot create a safe place to work because I think we have to remember that these two partners do not feel safe together. And until we've moved through stage one, in a way they cannot be empathic to one another, we are the safe base for stage one because they're caught in a negative cycle. And so whatever one partner does is exactly what triggers the other person's attachment panic. Now, they might not always recognize the panic. They might just notice they get reactive. But that's how it is that we can't expect them to be empathic. And even if they were, like even if there was an injury and the injure, injuring partner, if, if for some reason we forgot the model and went straight to, can't you see how much your partner is hurting after what you did? Even if they were able to say, of course I get it. I feel so bad. They still can't really empathize because their own, um, you know, regrets, remorse, panic, that they'll never be able to make the repair, all of that is going on. So we're the safe, we need to be the safe base in stage one. So we need to find a way. And I think when you think of step two, like tracking the cycle, when we, we need to find a way that we can be empathic to each one, that we can attune to, as you said, these two people that are still so important to each other and they're caught in this painful cycle, right? So that's where um, EFT gives us a, a framework. Attachment gives us a framework to attune to the two partners, whether there's been an injury or a gradual erosion to, oh, I get it. You feel so unsure that you're even wanted anymore by your partner so unsure that you're wanted that you immediately fire up in defense or go quiet and turn away. Oh, I get it. You're so afraid you don't matter anymore. You're so afraid your partner doesn't want to be there. In fact, isn't there. So it's understandable that you go after, you know, turn up the volume and get louder and louder. So as we hear ourselves reflecting and tracking the basic step two, we become more empathic, right? We, we really attune to that. But then, as you're saying, if there's been a specific injury, if there's finger pointing right from the start about this event, when I was let down, yes, we need to um, boldly include that in the cycle, right? We're saying, yeah, so since that event happened, the trust is really shattered. I get that since you discovered that, um, you know, whatever it was, the discovery of the, um, the receipt for, you know, a box of chocolates that you bought for the other person at work, or, you know, the discovery of that, um, or even the partner's confession, since that moment that you have felt completely shattered and cannot trust. Mm -hmm. And then we're tracking the cycle that's happening right now. Mm -hmm. But we're not trying to figure out why did it happen or what, what did it used to be before as much as first we're joining with the couple in this highly revved up state of how does it go right now that you can't even have a conversation. You can't have a healing conversation to use hold me tight language because right now you get so triggered. So that's what we're doing. So we don't have to panic that we can't fix it yet or figure out why it happened. We just need to follow the model, follow their emotional experience, order what's happening for them. So I really like that, how you say, you know, we can't even have a healing conversation in the here and now because we get so caught up. So when we're able to join in that way, when, when then would we move from, um, we can't have the healing conversation to the here and now to trying to track what, what did this look like before? How did we get to this place? Well, um, I mean, in, in the, the very early stages, we're finding out about the relationship. So we're hearing, I mean, I ask 
I ask some questions in the intake form. So because I don't like the initial to be a lot of question and answer, I want you know the, it to be an organic conversation with them from the start. But we're we'll we'll hear like someone will say, you know, that the best time was, you know, 25 years ago when we planned our wedding, we were together. You know, we did it all together. But it feels like since then, I've been running the whole show and I couldn't count on him, right? So, so we've got that. We can keep that alive. We can keep as a resource knowing that there was a time that the two of you really felt safe and in sync. And, and now it's different. But what we're working with is the present moment. So we're working with Right now, you've come in very angry and upset about this event that just happened. So now what we're tracking is how you're stuck. Mm-hmm. Right? We've got the resources of the past, but now we're tracking how you're stuck. So now we're, now we're tracking the present cycle that's blocking you from even being able to have the conversations that you long to have. Or, mm-hmm. right? So you know, we stay with that through stage one primarily. Right? To, to uh, de-escalate that. And, and so let's go into stage one for the partner who has trouble being truthful. Let's, because, you know, I think um, dealing with overt lies can be a, a little bit more, um, a little more of a challenge for therapists to deal with. So how would we put that into the cycle when you have one partner who really doesn't feel like they can tell the truth. So you're saying, I really don't, I can't tell the truth. Oh, so I would go into that, right? So you're saying it's really hard to tell the truth. I worry the minute I tell the truth, I'm going to get blasted anyway. So I, I just kind of hedge on the truth. So you, is that, for example, is that what could happen? Oh, so um probably want to order that a little more find out about what what are the triggers you know what are the attachment meanings that you make but so i'm just making this up i don't have an exact example of that in mind but if you're um saying you're saying to me it's really hard to tell the truth to my partner it it kind of feels like oh no here we go again if i even say i stopped um you know, for a coffee on the way home, I'm, I'm afraid, you know, my partner isn't going to believe me. So I just end up saying I, you know, had to stay later at work or I end up getting caught. Really, you get caught in all these tangles of lies, so worried you're not going to say the right thing, so worried your partner won't approve. Oh, so that's a fear that's running the show for you a lot. Right? You get, and when do you get this? Uh oh, I don't think what I, if I tell the truth, I don't think it's going to be acceptable. When does that happen? So you track a very concrete, specific cycle of, well, it's when I see that, that, hear that tone of voice or see that look on, you know, on my partner's face. Oh, that's when you get this, uh oh, kind of danger moment and you find yourself slipping straight into making up stories. Oh. And and what and so you might hear more about you know what like what the what the danger is and and so then you might even shape an enactment you might say can you turn and say to your partner it's true I get so rattled about wanting to get it right with you that I keep stepping into lies with you can you turn and share it and then you process that you know you might create you know you go through a tangle and then it's like what was it like to your partner say it's true I get so worried about pleasing you I end up slipping into lies. And then the partner says, oh, you know, it's about time. You know, you know, that wasn't a lie. That's true. That feels different. So then you, then you would um, heighten the, the difference of what they just did. But, you know, you make sense of it not as there's a bad person in this room. There's a liar here. What you make sense of it as that's their attachment strategy, right? That, that is what this person does to avoid, to avoid getting uh, lambasted. They end up slipping into this pattern. And then you, then you track how that triggers their partner who, who is ready to uh, jump down their throat or send a detective out after them no matter what. So then you have, that's what, that's the, you know, recurring problem, the feedback loop. That's really, really helpful. I'm so glad that you said that. So I love, it sounds like you're saying, you know, through EFT, we're not going to, you know, jump to blaming the partner who, you know, can't, who struggles with telling the truth. 
we're going to look at the attachment fears and longings underneath that prevents them from feeling like it's safe to be honest with their partner. And then kind of, in a way, help them own that by saying, you know, I get so caught up trying to, you know, uh, please you, or maybe in other cases, protect myself. So I end up telling lies. And in that way, they're kind of owning that place, which may help the other partner feel like, okay, they're owning the fact that they do, that they are dishonest to me. But then, you know, I can hear in stage one that other partner is going to escalate and say, well, now how do I get you to stop, <laughs> stop telling lies and just tell me, you know, yeah. stop pleasing me and just be truthful with me. Right. And then you would validate that too. You would say, you want so much to find out how the two of you can interact in a way that's safer. You really don't want your partner to be on guard all the time for fear of your um, being unhappy with them. You really want to find a way. And we haven't found that yet, but we're getting there because what we're doing first is we're tracking how you guys get stuck. Mm -hmm. Right. Not because you don't matter to each other, but because you have these rapid self-protective reactions. Mm -hmm. Right. But, you know, but maybe part of responding to what you said now was it's hard to hear this from your partner. It, it's painful to be the one that keeps saying, can I trust? Can I trust? Am I being fooled again? It's hard to hear this. Part of you just wants to to, uh, you know, jump up and down and say, let's stop this now. Let's change it. This has been really hard for you to live in this relationship with lots of mis untruths, yeah? So you need to feel that I get your dilemma before I try to point out what we're doing, right? But then I will validate also um, that, of course, you want to change this. And, you know, if we're like in steps one and two and we're still getting a are we, do we have a compatible agenda kind of assessment? I would check with the other partner. I imagine you want to change this too, am I right? You also would like if you guys could change this relationship together so you wouldn't have to be so on guard and, and uh, telling lies before you even think about the truth. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is somehow you guys have gotten yourselves caught in a relationship with lots of mistrust and lack of safety and you're doing your best to keep it going, to keep the relationship going. So we're really gonna slow it down and look at how you slip into these automatic places and we'll find a safer way for you to talk about the underlying fears and worries and longings. That's really good. That's really helpful. Wow, wow. I love how you frame that and that's, that's so helpful. And so are, is there any particular ways in which, you know, as a supervisor and a trainer, you've probably seen, you know, how do people get caught or stuck, the, the therapist gets stuck in stage one um, when it comes to trying to work with trust issues? Well, <clears throat> I think sometimes um, there might be other ways, but the first thing that comes to mind is that people get stuck because they're trying to fix it. They're trying to help people, um, uh, you know, be vulnerable and take in what the other one is saying and, and be moved by that, some of which does happen for sure, but it, not if we're trying to make that happen. I think we first have to... Um, order the emotional experience that we first have to kind of validate um, mistrust, right? Or, you know, we, there's so much power in validating that people cannot trust right now. Um, and that we, we have to order that, right? We have to remember that emotion isn't just affect. Emotion is this feeling, meaning, action process. So we're ordering it. We're tracking the, the, the triggers, the action tendencies, the meanings people are making, and we're making the links. We have to keep making the links over and over between um, secondary emotion or hopefully, you know, when the primary emotion is accessed, making that link with what people do. I saw someone recently do this beautiful job of helping the more withdrawn partner access that, like he gets really angry and frightens his wife. He has these anger outbursts, right? So he accessed the, um, the fear underneath that when he, when he sees an argument brewing, he can see they're about to have an argument and he's a good fighter, right? But he sees that coming and he's like, uh-oh, this relationship's never gonna make it. He was able through the therapist's slow tracking able to access that underlying fear. 
that when I fire up and blast her in anger, before that blast of anger, I've got this dreadful fear that we're not going to make it, right? And so that was a really beautiful enactment that he did to share that with his partner who was thrilled because she'd never seen such congruence of his vulnerable fear and his, um, you know, in his face and his tone of voice and that. And then it's so important to keep that alive as you're tracking, right? So when the partner is like, yeah, I've always been so afraid of your anger. I get, you know, it frightens me and I feel abused and I feel, um, you know, like verbally abused kind of by that. The, the importance is you did to keep it alive. You didn't know that under this blast of anger is his fear of losing you. You never knew that before. So of course it's been very frightening. And I think that often therapists forget the power of keeping that attachment piece alive, right? That he hasn't stopped his anger yet. We're just, we're just ordering that now. But to hear that to hear that repeated again and again, that link between his anger outbursts and his underlying fear of losing her, right? So that as long as, you know, she may not be able to fully take that in yet, but we're, we're continually making this safe place to, to do this exploration, right? So you said something really important about the repeated link, and I think that's a place that I also notice some fellow therapists getting stuck is especially newer beginning EFT therapists is they feel like they're beating a dead horse when they repeat. But for us, repeating the, the repetition of the link is very important. It serves a very important purpose because as you just said, in the beginning when we're first kind of ordering these experiences, they may not be able to fully like soak it in. So we keep repeating, keep linking it, and then it sinks and they're able to like more and more internalize that and and really sit and gel with that link and it then it becomes maybe less of a threat exactly because what the link is it's it's an attachment link it's a link about the emotional process and it validates both people at the same time because i think that's another answer to your question which i almost I think your question was, where do people get stuck? And I think that particularly when you have volatility and hostility or rigid kind of shutdown, when you're working with one partner, you, you really want what you're saying to them to fit for them, but you're really wanting it to contain an element of validation for the other one. Mm -hmm. Right? And so I was going to say too, like you had also said in part of the getting stuck, and I think it might be some of the self of the therapist coming out is, some of that panic that comes from the betrayed partner, the hurt partner that says, I, I want them to tell me the truth. How do we get them to start telling me the truth right away? And you hear that panic and then the therapist maybe starts to feel like, okay, I got to find a way to get this partner to start telling them the truth. And that's yeah. where we're tempted to rush that process because you have a pursuer, an anxious pursuer probably who's looking at you and saying, okay, I, I hear this. I hear my partner saying, that yes, they tell lies, we know they tell lies. Okay, great, now tell me, when are they gonna stop telling lies? And then we're sitting like with egg on our face, like, uh. <laughs> so, so how would we address a, a pursuer, maybe who puts that back on us and says, okay, now how do I get them to stop telling me lies? Because that question comes up a lot in session. Uh-huh. Well, I think like you used a nice expression, you wanna rush the process. And you could even use that to your client. You could say, I understand you just wanna rush this process. You just wanna like, let's change him. If we could just change my partner, then everything's gonna be okay. And what we need to do together is track, how does this happen between you? We really wanna track this two person dance, right? Where the more, um, you know, like I, I'm, I'm making this up a little, but what I think just happened between you guys is you said, so how do we get him to stop lying? And, and he just turned and, and dropped his face, right? So it's almost like the cycle's happening right here. And it's got such a good intention. But you say, how can I trust him? And he hears it maybe as a little bit of a, a push because somehow you just kind of dropped your head and turned away. And when you see him drop his head and turn away, you probably want to you know, wake them up and move this along. So we're going to look at how this process, am I right? You know, you would check, is that right? Is that kind of happening right now? You know, the, the step two, right? The more you push to make it better, the more you kind of go, what can I do? And you kind of turn away. Am I right? Did we just have a little glimpse of that cycle? So, so 
we know the steps to follow to get to get to a place where your relationship will be safer. I think, and too, what you're, you're kind of bringing this up too, I think, and tell me if I'm getting this right, if this is part of stage step three, mm -hmm. when we hear that maybe anxious pursuer who's going back and saying, okay, great, now how do you get them to stop lying to me? We can kind of go into their underlying fear mm -hmm. That I'm never going to be, you know, I'm, my partner's never going to tell me the truth. I'm never going to be able to trust them. And it becomes really scary for them. So they have a primary fear, but they get this anxious kind of angry push at their partner, like, stop lying to me, stop lying to me. And then part of the tracking is maybe that partner hears, I'm never going to get it right. No matter how hard I try, it's never going to be good enough. You're never going to trust me. And then they get hijacked by shame or something. Am, am I getting this right? And I think, I think what you said there is really good, too, is that this could be a way, like when the partner says, so how can we get, how can I get him to tell the truth? This could be, as you said, um, a segue into step three. If you really, you know, if you could say, I'm curious what just happened right now. Like he just turned and, and did this enact or told, shared with you that he knows he does lie. And at first you said, oh, so good to hear that was true. So good to hear. And then you kind of jumped into how do we get it to stop? Is it almost um, like what just happened before you said that? Or is you, you, that's an evocative question or you might use a conjecture. Um, you know, if this was, uh, you might use a conjecture like, was that one of those moments where you got that, uh-oh, it was great to have the truth, but I don't know if it's going to happen again. Um, or, you know, yeah, that, of course, of course I don't trust this. You don't trust this. You don't trust him right now. It's what is, it must be scary to live in a relationship when you don't know if you can trust the guy you love most of all. So I, in a way I gave a few conjectures there, but I was trying to pretend I was staying close to her experience, right? And so that is a good way that you might access the underlying fear, the fear of, yeah, I'm afraid all the time he could leave any day. How do I know? Every time he's late to coming home, I panic. And then he makes up these stories, so I panic more. Okay, so that fear, when you get that fear of, is he going to be around? Does, uh, am I, do I really matter? What do you automatically do, right? So we're still going to work with action tendency, like step two and step three. Oh, so what you automatically do in that panic is you start pummeling him with questions. Oh, so can you talk, you know, so you might set up an enactment where you're linking the trigger, the underlying panic, and the action tendency. I think that's another answer to your question. I think where people get stuck in stage one is they forget the power of stage one. Mm -hmm. They forget that they can be excellent EFT therapists and spend a fair bit of time in steps two and three. Yeah, I think it's, it's not about getting to blame or softening tomorrow or even today. It's about this following this amazing model. Right, right. And not and, and for the therapist to be able to sit with that panic and not feel this when they're feeling the urgency of the client to hurry up and fix it, that they don't kind of absorb that panic and then join the cycle in that way. And that oh, right. Yes. And I think I have an example in my book of that where the where the uh, therapist feels the panic, feels the pressure from the, the client that says, okay, like now make it better. I've apologized. I, I, you know, like, can't you get her to change or can't you get her to believe me? Like, well, how long is this going to take? So the therapist has this, can feel her heart pounding and this panic to want to just make it better quickly. And then um, I think the example is something like simply in reflecting what's happening helped to, you know, calm the therapist down, right? So she turns to the, to the client that's pushing and getting um, forceful and saying, right now you want so much for me just to change this. You just wish we could change this all in an instant and maybe add something about how much you long to trust her again or how much you're longing to be trusted again that you just want to force her to... You know, it's not unlike catching a bullet in a way, but it calms the therapist down to put it out there to say, yeah, it's this bad. You want it to happen right now, right? And then you maybe you just are a little bit transparent is that we know how to get there, right? We can't do it quite yet, but, but you might even reframe that push as 
well, if you reframe it, but yeah, is that right? You're just, you yeah. just want to happen really fast and you might even have them own that and turn and say, it's true. I get so impatient for you to forgive me and trust me. I know I push you. Can you turn and tell her that? Yeah, that's great. And, and I think to maybe a sign and, and tell me if I'm getting this right, that the therapist might be rushing a little bit too much, um, maybe through, cause you said, you know, we need to validate the reactive emotions. And so maybe a sign that we're rushing too much from reactive to primary to try to get to that vulnerability in stage one is we'll ask, you know, um, one of the partners to share a vulnerable emotion, like maybe primary fear, but it comes out as an anxious attack, which says we're still in reactive secondary emotion. And so yeah. they're not quite in fear and that, that enactment may fall apart because you haven't spent enough time in that reactive secondary. Am I getting that right? If it happens, you could say, uh, you know, Sally, what just happened? I think you were about to share your fear with Josh. And then what happened is it kind of slipped away. And I think something else happened, right? You know, like maybe she was going, <laughs> and, so, and like, well, yeah, like, so it's almost like when you turn to him to tell him about the fear, it got too difficult. And you kind of went back into the old cycle where you start pointing out his failings, is that what happened? Mm -hmm. So then you would stay, you know, then you would stay with that a little bit longer. But I think you're right. It's, we don't have to say, oh no, I blew it. I shouldn't have been doing that. You just realize, oh yeah, that, that was too fast. Mm -hmm. um, so that maybe then you will go into, so what happens is the fear comes up and before you know it, you slip into, um, into finger pointing or you slip into questioning you know, why the hell does he do this? Is that how it goes? So you're back to tracking the link between three and two. And then, oh, so could you maybe, it was a bit too hard to share the fear right now. Um, and I think it's often a, a problem. I think therapists think if we share the fear, if we share the uh, vulnerable underlying emotion, the partner's going to go, oh, really? Oh, well, then there's no problem. But they can't do that because they get triggered. Right? So you might have them share the link you might have her share it's true when i am so afraid i don't matter to you anymore i do come at you with tons of questions can you just tell them that right then it becomes safer and then you know then you're tracking um maybe he never knew that under all those questions was this fear that he didn't still want her you know and then you really move quite safely into the underlying experience but never losing the the kind of whole organization because that's how people get that they're not too bad people. They're just, you know, too important people getting stuck. That's wonderful. And so let's move into stage two and how, um, let's talk about some blocks to that may come up in stage two with um, repairing trust. And one of the most common ways that um, I've found and, and that some other therapists have shared with me when you know, we get the, maybe the anxious pursuer to turn to their partner and say, you know, I'm, I'm really struggling in this moment to trust, you know, I've just been triggered and I'm really scared. How do I know I can trust you? And the, maybe the withdrawn partner or the, the betrayer tells them, you know, offers that reassurance, but then the betrayed partner just won't, well, how do I know when they say everything's fine and I have nothing to worry about? That, that I really can believe it. And, and most often this comes when, um, so we'll talk about this quickly, this particular um, injury to trust. And a lot of people have, and it turns out a lot of people have not heard the term gaslighting. And, and I'll just quickly describe um, what gaslighting is. And it comes from a movie, I think it was either in the 30s or the 40s, a black and white movie with Ingrid Bergman called Gaslight. It's a great movie. Look it up. It's, it's phenomenal. And basically gaslighting is where one partner may tell the other partner, everything's fine. You know, you're, you're, they may even use the words, you're, you're crazy for thinking something's wrong. You know, like they kind of go above and beyond to, you know, quiet the suspicions of the other partner while doing something that they know is suspicious or stepping out. So they may tell their partner, you're crazy for thinking I'm having an affair while having an affair. And then that other partner 
think, you know, finds out. And so now that trust is injured because they can't trust their partner when they say everything's fine. You have nothing to worry about because they've said that before and it was attached to a lie. Right, right. And we probably all had that kind of situation where we, we feel that we're moving through de-escalation, we're moving into stage two, and, and there's trust is beginning to be rebuilt, and then somebody goes back to the affair partner, or, you know, and then, um, then we're definitely back in stage one, right? But, it, but not all is not lost, because we're working with a couple who has had, you know, we've been, we've been de-escalating, and there's, there's already the alliance built in that. But I do think that this example you're giving, where um, someone says, you're crazy to think there's anything wrong, everything's fine now, uh, that does sound like stage one yet, doesn't it? It does sound like the cycle hasn't really de-escalated. It sounds like when someone says, I'm still getting afraid, I don't know if I can trust, and the partner isn't saying, I get you're still afraid. It makes sense you're still afraid because I know I really, I really broke your trust. The partner is reacting, saying you're crazy. You shouldn't be so worried. I'm not, I, there's nothing to be afraid of. That sounds like we're still in stage one reactivity. Well, even if they're not, maybe, you know, may, well, when I say you know, you're crazy for thinking anything's wrong, it comes when they were kind of gaslighting their partner, not, not during the repair process, but during the repair process when the, when the, triggered partner turns to the betraying partner and says, right now I'm struggling, I need reassurance, I can trust you. And that reassuring partner says, you know, I promise, you know, they, they do gen, you know, genuinely reach their partner and back and say, you know, I understand, you know, I get that it's hard, but I really do, I really am, you know, telling you the truth, I'm not hiding anything. And the other partner has a hard time really taking that in. They kind of block that that right. reach back from the partner and says, no, I, I can't really believe it. Even though you're coming at me softly, even though you're telling me and trying to reassure me, I just right. can't believe it. What do we do then when they can't believe the reach back? Well, I think we again fall back on the model and we check with ourselves. Where are we in this process, right? Are we, I think this is another problem. I recently had somebody write to me and say, I'm trying to do the steps of the AIRM, but, and then described a situation where, you know, actually they were still in stage one. So that's, I think that's a common problem. We know we have this amazing validated model that can help people uh, rebuild after an injury and rebuild trust. Um, and it belongs at a certain place in the model. We can't do it in stage one. And so you're, the example though that you're coming up with, um, I, I, you know, as a therapist, you'd want to step back and say, okay, where are we in the model? Do we have, um, uh, you know, have, have I engaged the withdrawer enough? Is this a withdrawer who's, I'm assuming, although I've written several cases where the withdrawer was the injured partner, but I think the case you're making right now is you're describing the injured partner was the pursuer and the, the one who did the betrayal was the withdrawer. Is that correct? Or however, however it goes, just the injured partner not really fully being able to sit with the betrayer really trying to offer reassurance. Right, well, and that's where I, I, we have to check. Do we have withdrawal re-engagement? Do we have enough engagement? Or is this the, um, you know, or is this somebody trying to say, yeah, yeah, like I'm, I'm trying real hard to reassure you. I'm doing all of this. Um, so, although if the, uh, if the withdrawer is the one who's asking, but just the way the example you gave didn't sound like it was the withdrawer asking, but regardless, what we know is we have to follow the steps of the model and that the rebuilding trust has a precise way in which we do it. And it requires that the hurt be um, expanded and reprocessed. So the injured partner needs to be able to share the nub of the injury, needs to be vulnerable, um, in terms of describing how hurt they were by that. And the partner who's done the injury needs to be engaged enough that they can attune to this. They can't do that in stage one. If they're a withdrawer who hasn't re-engaged yet, they probably can't do it now either because they'll get triggered. And they'll say, no, I promise you I'm not hurting you. Or they say, I'm so sorry. I know that was hard for you. I'm so sorry. It won't happen again. I'm here now. But that's not enough. 
because that's not the interpersonal resolution process that the AIRM shows us. In that process, the injured partner needs to deeply engage with the injury and share it. They need to have their, in, their partner being able to tune into their pain. They need to see their own pain mirrored on their partner's face. So you really have to be engaged to be able to do that because all of the other apologies and promises are coming from a place of, I hope you can forgive me. I did a bad thing. I hope we can get past it. But this is coming from, this is a different depth, right? And they also need to hear from the injure, like the, the person who did the injury needs to be able to describe how they could have done this so that they can be, become predictable again. So your question, I think, is a marvelous question because um, that's where we really need this model because we know that somebody's saying, I'm so afraid, what if you do it again? Uh, partly what they need to hear is, um, this is how it happened, this is how I did it. And the answer usually is rooted in the negative cycle, but it has to come from the person's heart. So in the attachment injury repair, model training video, the guy says, I think I was trying to get even with you. As horrible as it sounds, I think I was trying to hurt you. Like that is gut wrenching. You know, he's like mortified as he says it. And yet he's living with the pain. He's not dodging from it. And she is hearing it. That makes sense, right? It has to make sense. How could you have done this horrible thing to me? So that's, um, when you run into the problem that you just described, you know, trust it. That's a really important question. Of, of course, you can't trust him yet. Of course, you're still afraid. You ask um, him or her, you ask your partner, how do I know this won't happen again? And of course, you don't trust yet. Right? And so you're still terrified this could happen again. Doesn't make sense to you yet. It happened once. How, how could it not happen again? Am I answering your question? Yeah, so a lot of things came up for me um, while you're saying that, a lot of really helpful stuff. So I'm thinking, um, and, and for those of you who maybe don't know when, when Lori is using AIRM, that's the Attachment Injury Repair Model, it's kind of like a sub-model within EFT that we use to repair attachment injuries. It's like we may spend a session or a couple sessions around a particular injurious event and, you know, try to heal it using the attachment injury repair. But what it sounds like is that maybe if we've kind of rushed through the process, maybe we're in stage two, but we haven't quite achieved withdrawal re-engagement. And maybe, you know, help me with this, if we've achieved withdrawal re-engagement, if they're the one who has committed the injury, maybe that engagement might look like them actively or in some way trying to proactively help their partner feel safe to trust because they do want to earn that trust back. Um, and maybe if we haven't quite gotten to that, it's going to, it's going to look more like the injured, the, the partner who did the injuring is going to keep trying to evade or avoid being accused of committing this injury rather than turning to their partner and trying to say, how can I help you feel more safe? How can I reassure you? What can I do that lets you know that I am safe, that I am telling the truth? They want to rebuild that trust. So it, it, I think what you might, maybe what you're saying is in re-engagement, it's going to be easier to help the partner who's feeling betrayed maybe feel more reinsured because they're going to see that uh, the effects from withdrawal re-engagement from the injured partner, it'll look different. It'll look more like them re-engaging in the way that they're moving towards their partner in a way that says, I want you to trust me. I want you to know that it's safe. I want to rebuild this rather than how long are we going to deal with this? How long are you going to not, you know, trust me for, to me, what it sounds like you're saying is that's more reactive and, and still maybe stuck in, in stage one. Mm -hmm. And stage one, we want the partner who did the injuring to be able to make some, or maybe through the attachment injury repair model, um, you know, to be able to kind of own their, their story of maybe why they did this or how they could do that, which can be very powerful because it helps. Right, well, that is a part of the attachment injury resolution model is, uh, you know, they, there is usually some, there is often some resistance or some minimizing from the, from the injuring partner. But um, 
as you move into like what's called like step four of this sub model, as you said, you know, that there is asking that question and that can be challenging for therapists because you're feeling like they're moving along and now you're going to sort of zing the offending partner with a question like, how could it have happened that you would do this? But when we understand what, what it's about, we, um, um, we can trust it. It can feel safe to do that because everybody needs to make sense out of we're you know emotion makes sense, and so we're all we're making sense out of this. It's not the why kind of sense. It's it's more the how. Like how could it have happened? Right? You love this person so much, you know, and yet you stabbed her in the back. How could it happen that you could stab this beautiful person in the back? Right? And. Uh, then they, they experience that emotion in the moment. They experience their own, um, you know, their own deep dilemma and they put words to it. So I think it's, uh, I, th I think you're right. We, we want, we know when someone's engaged, they are um, uh, not as likely to disappear though. They might still have some reactivity, but they won't disappear and just go into trying to be the perfect partner they'll be engaged with themselves as well now how many steps are there to the attachment injury resolution model well it has eight steps a mini model within with you know it's a it's a it's a step to process and sometimes when you do the if the pursuing partner has been injured sometimes going through this process is all that's needed for pursuer softening and they're pretty well you know the bond is restored sometimes there could be a little bit more to do after that and uh, um, if the withdrawer is the one who's been injured it will be a, a complete withdrawal re-engagement and then they'll probably still have some blame or softening to do after that and where can folks find the steps um, of attachment injury repair model? Is there a place where they can find that? Well, it's, it's um, certainly, there's many articles that have been written. Um, um, I, um, the first one was possibly in 2001, but I think the most useful one is by Zuccarini et al. And it was uh, probably written in 2013. Um, in my book, I, it will be a reference definitely given in my book. Of course, I go through the steps in my, my book, Stepping into Emotionally Focused Couple Therapy. Um, and uh, if you look at the attachment injury resolution model um, training program that Lillian Buchanan and I put together, which you can access by Googling attachmentinjuryrepair.com, um, we outline the steps. We show... Um, you know, each of those steps. Um, so uh, those are the, if anyone has taken the EFT externship training, you, you receive uh, articles on that in the training as well. Um, okay, perfect. So uh, you said attachmentinjuryrepair.com? Yeah. Perfect. I just, I mean, it, just Google attachment injury repair. Yeah. Perfect. Yes. Perfect. So Lori, um, you have a book that you wrote for EFT therapists. Can you tell us a little bit more about your book? Okay, it's called Stepping into Emotionally Focused Couple Therapy, Key Ingredients of Change. And if you want to read about the book and decide if you want to purchase it, you can go to um, a website, just Google Stepping into EFT. And um, there I have summaries of all the chapters and um, there's... Uh, a few videos about couples that are that you can purchase through that website as well. But um, I was asked to write this book as an introduction to EFT, so it's written um, in that way for people totally new to the model. A lot of therapists are finding it to be helpful if they are already doing EFT as well. Um, so the foreword is written by Sue Johnson and Allison Lee. Um, and... Uh, if you are if you're already studying EFT and you've taken core skills, it quite closely follows the core skills format. Um, so we go through each of the steps of the model. I have um, introduced at the beginning of the book three couples that we kind of follow through the book. One couple that's a pretty traditional pursue, withdraw. Uh, one couple that's uh, pretty volatile, um, 
has volatile attack attack sequences but as you follow them closely you see that one is more a pursuer and one is more a withdrawer and then one couple that comes into therapy in a withdraw withdraw um, um, situation and so there's also some um, uh, discussion about attack about addiction processes in EFT. And there is a chapter on the attachment injury resolution model with a case example going through all the steps and stages. So it's pretty simply laid out there. Um, right, so there's these three couples that you hear about throughout the, the book, but there's also a therapist named Emily um, who, so throughout the book, you also get to hear therapists' inner thoughts as they're trying to um, integrate this model and uh, issues of trusting herself as a therapist, trusting the process of EFT, and um, how to attune and um, resonate with the clients throughout the process. So it's, it's pretty simple in that regard, but I, I reference lots of the current research as well. Excellent. And we can put the link to your book in the description for this video. Now, do you have any training tapes that people can order or subscribe to that show examples of your work with couples um, to help them in their own work? Well, they're um, on that website for the book, because in the book it says there will be some videos you can purchase. Um, I just felt they couldn't, in the length of the book, put enough transcript in it. So on the website, Stepping into EFT, there is a video of um, um, a couple in stage one and a video of a couple in stage two. So those are um, accessible through that. Perfect. And then other, uh, yes, so you can also, I should mention a website, carolinaeft.com, because that's our center. And there's a resources tab there. You can access uh, written resources there as well. Articles that Sue Johnson has done, articles that I've done. And um, also my website, lbrewbaker.com, um, has a, uh, um, a resources page where I link to all my publications and there's other EFT things on both sites. Okay. And you offer trainings. Do you, what kind of workshops and trainings do you offer for the EFT community? Well, I do, um, I do externships and core skills. Presently that's, um, you know, that that's primarily what I'm doing. Um, so there's, a, um, an externship coming up here in Greensboro in June. June six to nine, and uh, we do core skills on an ongoing basis. And uh, yeah, perfect. Mm -hmm. So if folks want to attend, maybe one of your core skills or your externships, they can just go to the Carolina. That's right. Yeah, okay. and any specialty trainings that we're doing are listed on that website as well. Perfect. And if anyone wants to contact you and maybe bring you out to their area to do a training, how would they get in touch with you? Um, well, my, my, um, e my email address uh, is laurie at lbrewbaker.com. You'll find it on any of those web, well, you'd find it on my website at least, but it's laurie, L-O-R-R-I-E, at l-b-r-u-b-a-c-h-e-r.com. Perfect. And we will put links to the Carolina Center for EFT for Lori for your site and for your book as well in the description for this video. So folks will have all of those resources that they can go ahead and find you and uh, hopefully purchase a copy of your wonderful book. So thank you again so much, Lori, for being with us today. It's really exciting to have you and to be able to speak with you. It was really nice talking with you, Annabelle. Your uh, questions were just made it a, a flowing conversation. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. You're welcome. And thank you so much to our viewers. Make sure that you keep watching because more videos are on the way. <laughs> Thank you.